Welcome to San Diego Integral, December 9th, 2023. Our topic today, Integral Entrepreneurship and the Meta Crisis, presented by Dr. Matt Kreinheader. Welcome to San Diego Integral. I'm Tom Habib. I had to check my name. <laughs> and I'm a member of the San Diego Integral's leadership team. We have an exciting presentation today. It's called Integral into Entrepreneurship in the Meta Crisis with Dr. Matt Kreinheader. We will begin shortly, but I first wanted to mention that we will be recording this meeting. If you prefer not to be seen on video, uh, you can just turn off your camera, although we do like to see your faces and your reactions. The link of the recording will be posted on Meetup a day or two after the event um, just look for the YouTube San Diego Integrals Meetup channel. Also, you can find out about future events on our website at sandiegointegral.org or the Meetup a Facebook page. The advantage of joining one of these uh, groups, you'll be automatically notified uh, when a new event is added. If you ever have questions or comments about these meetings, you're welcome to contact one of the leadership team through Meetup or Facebook. Next month's meeting will be January 13th, 2024. And Jeff Snyder, uh, the title of his talk will be Purposeless Meeting at the Second Tier, Research Between Developmental Stage and Personal Meaning. Finally, we invite you to make a small, small donation today through the Meetup page, or mm. some of you may be aware that I am heading up the um, in Integral Conference of North America, and we are looking for donations there. And here is the link I just put in the chat for it. San Diego Integral is heavily involved in building this conference. And um, some of the people here have already donated. Thank you. Okay, without further ado, uh, Eloy is going to introduce tonight's speaker. Okay, so I wanna welcome you all here to um, be with, uh, as you heard him called Dr. Matt, Matt, um, uh, I knew Matt as a chiropractor years ago, but an energetic chiropractor. And Matt's, Matt's a hero of mine um, because I followed him through the years. And he is he's just a badass, go after whatever needs to be um, examined, delved into, worked on carefully and deeply. And um, I watched him shift directions and he's he's just a, a leading edge evolutionary guy. He wrote this this book called um, Awakening the Mystics. You probably cry for the dormant mystic archetype in the time we need it most. Pretty amazing book. Um, let's see, he's working on a on a PhD. He's multi multi multiple degree. Um, has a, a degree in the chiropractic and the. Um, Oriental medicine, and um, he has been spreading the word of integral for all the years I've known him. Uh, maybe I don't know six, seven years, uh, in different in places you wouldn't expect people would be interested in integral. He's just like opened the opened the window and said, "Take a peek," and um, and pre and and is able to present it in a context that would make sense to to that audience, and. Um, See, in our leadership group, we knew, we have um, Liz O'Grady. I met Liz through one of Dr. Matt's talks. Um, and I've also had great experience with uh, doing energetic work with him. So um, I think we're all in for a treat. I saw his video on from IAC, and I'm just, we're in for a treat. So with that, I hand it to you, Dr. Matt. Goodness gracious, I'm gonna make an integral's blush. Such high praise. Thank you, Eloy and Carrie and Tom and everyone else. That was such a warm welcome. I feel 
really blessed and honored to be here with you. Um, yeah, I, my my intent today is that we get up to a whole bunch of fun and maybe some new ideas and maybe some expansive frames and uh, but also some deep connection with each other. And I think that's the place that I would like to start. Uh, I've found after, like most of us, many years of being on Zoom, that it's really easy to become a floating brain in the space. So I want to make sure that we're bringing all of our bodies here. And I use the multiple of bodies intentionally. So let's just take a, a couple moments. I just want to lead you through a quick guided practice to make sure that we're bringing our bodies with us. If you'd like to keep your eyes open, if you'd like to close them, uh, whatever you'd like is fine. And just let's take a moment and return to the breath. Just <sighs> feeling that breath expand in your physical being. Feeling that physical being with form, with matter, with a nervous system. That nervous system may be stressed and tense or relaxed and open. If you find it stressed and tense, I'm going to invite you to lead it towards relaxed and open. Ah. <sighs> And then as it moves more into the relaxed and open, feel where the body meets the energy body. Feel where the expansive self opens up. And in that expansive self, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna invite you into seeing if you can feel the we. Can you feel all of us here on this call? Can you feel us as a collective, bringing our hearts, our minds, our bodies, our spirits, not disconnected individual entities alone. We are, of course, that. But we are more than that. Connected through our interests, through our calls, through our soul mission, and through this fascinating leading edge of integral theory. So as we breathe, as we be, as I invite you back into the space, eyes open, present and ready for learning, I'll invite you to also, as we're chatting, hold this awareness of us being a we, as in, in addition to being an I. Yay, thank you. I can feel you all more fully, and I appreciate that. Um, so a, a few of you have been to talks that I've given, and so I'm going to list some of the standard rules for Dr. Matt talks, <laughs> and that is that at some point in this talk, I'm going to ask a question, and the question is designed to pull us out of passive, passive listening and into active engagement. Because I know if you listen passively too long, the brain goes into a passive mode and we stop thinking. So I want to make sure that there's interaction, that there's dialogue, that there's spontaneous and organic interaction occurring because some of this will be fairly conceptual and I don't want to get lost there. So when I ask that question, there may be a moment of awkward silence. And my favorite thing to do in the awkward silence is to just wait and let everyone feel a little bit awkward until someone goes from passive to active and says, oh, it'll be me. I'll say something. Um, so that being said, just know that I invite conversation. Like I said, I like dialogue. I like organic. I want to make sure this isn't the Dr. Matt show. Um, and really the best things happen when we turn this into a speaking circle and it's not just centered on me uh, and the way that I'm thinking. So that being said, that sound good? Excellent. Thank you. We started, we passed the first participation test. So I'm going to present uh, two different sets of things today, all interwoven. Some of this is going to be content from the European Integral Conference, which a few people referenced earlier. Um, that talk was called Integral Entrepreneur's Role in the Oncoming Triple Singularity. 
that's a mouthful. We don't need too many mouthfuls. So just pared it down to integral entrepreneurship. But I also just finished a class this week for my PhD here at CIHS. CIHS. The PhD is in integral noetic sciences. And I developed a program and a course through that that I'm offering to entrepreneurs called um, The Way Showers. And there's a group called The Enlightened Entrepreneurs. I'll share more about that later. But essentially, it's examining the idea of spiritual entrepreneurship and what the role spirituality has to play in entrepreneurship. And there's a lot of crossover between integral entrepreneurs, spiritual entrepreneurs, and the meta crisis, because I think that we really have a role to play in all of this. So um, the first half of this is going to be speaking primarily to that integral framing for what has to happen in entrepreneurship. We'll do a breakout for 15 minutes or so, let you all digest that interact, have some dialogue and discussion. And then the second half, we'll have a few more slides more on the spiritual entrepreneurship side. And my goal here is not to give any sort of strategy and tactic about entrepreneurship, but to frame entrepreneurship as one of the critical ways that we have to break through what's happening in the meta crisis. So the kind of easy and simple way that I've been framing this is how integral entrepreneurs save the world because I, I wanna be careful with too much hubris. It's not any one thing, of course, that's gonna save the world, but I think we've got a role to play. So that being said, um, if there's no questions to start, I'll start with a couple slides here. And if there's any questions, as Eloy mentioned, just go ahead and raise your hand. Okay. Okay, so a little bit of background uh, about me, just so you have some context. Uh, really, my role tends to be an integral outsider. Uh, I'm uh, the type of person who likes to watch and think. I don't always engage uh, socially and ask questions. But as you'll see in this talk, I'm coming to a bit of, of a internal uh, cognitive dissonance and crisis because I know that the we is actually the most important feature of what needs to be created next. So you're probably going to start seeing me show up to more of these meetings, more of these spaces uh, as I have time because this collective is actually really very important. My natural orientation is to be a bit of a liminalist, a mystic, a hermit, and of course an entrepreneur, which is what we're talking about today, as Eloy mentioned. I wrote a book called Awakening the Mystics, which is more of an engagement of kind of that liminalist and mystic and hermit side. My background, uh, as Eloy mentioned, a couple undergraduate degrees in music and business, uh, master's in acupuncture, doctorate in chiropractic, doing a PhD in integral noetic sciences. I spent over a decade in practice, 20,000 hands-on sessions, um, transitioned more into coaching, primarily spiritual entrepreneurs. I've worked with six, seven, eight, nine figure entrepreneurs, really helping them find how they're going to grow a business that means something positive in the world and create positive ripples of transformation, but also how they feel right and aligned so that they can liberate their soul's mission through that business and it can satisfy the spiritual needs as well as the real world transformational needs. Um, I also, when I teach, like to demonstrate some of what might be my biases because when I listen to a speaker, I'm always tracking for what some of these types are. So if you catch me in any of these um, blind spots, you'll know that this is just where I'm coming from. So these are a lot of my uh, typologies. They may give you some insight if you're familiar with any of these typologies into why I present the way I do and, and some of the perspectives that these things are coming from. So that's enough background. I wanted to find Singularity, because in the initial version of this talk I gave at the IC, IEC, um, the triple singularity is essentially framing this very funny moment that's resulting in a meta crisis that we're currently finding ourselves in. So singularity is a word that really comes from mathematics and from physics. And it says a, a point in which a feature within a domain reaches a level of exponential growth and takes on an entirely new 
and sometimes unrecognizable set of characteristics, behaviors, and directions. So the place that most people are familiar with this is from physics. And in physics, a singularity is what happens at the center of a black hole. And that's where all the rules of physics from the gross realm, as we know them, start to break down, gravity, time, space, all become very different. And reality as we know it starts to transform into something completely different. And I think this moment in history that we are currently traversing is exactly that. It's a singularity. And what's so compelling about this for integralists is that it is a inherent feature of the leap to the second tier. Part of the chaos, part of the madness, part of the division that we're seeing in so many different domains around us is the breakdown that has to happen for the breakthrough to occur. And it would be nice if that leap to the second tier was more butterflies, more unicorns, more rainbows, more effortless ease. And sometimes that happens, but that's not always the thing that happens. And as you know from your own internal experience, that second tier set of realizations, moving from green to teal, comes with an ego death, comes with a, uh, a transcending of a lot of hard fought perspectives and beliefs. And that happens in every major breakthrough. So we're seeing that not just in the individual, that is one of the singularities, but also in two other domains, which we're going to go through in just a moment. So these singularities that we need to look at are in the upper right and up and lower right, the it and the its domain. So this is from the four quadrants in integral, as you know. This is the domain of truth. And when we look at the three gifts of the I, the we, and the it, the uh, they are light, love, and life. So the gift of the it domain is light. And the singularity, the breakdown before the breakthrough that we're seeing, all of these massively complexifying factors, AI, quantum computing, CRISPR, computer brain interfaces, and all manner of runaway tech that we don't really know how to correctly steward yet. We're in very much in the dialogue of how to engage that. In the upper left is the I domain, and its gifts are beauty and life. And that is the domain that we're most used to talking about in Integral. That is the breakthrough to the second tier. And our opportunities, and part of what we're gathering here to do today, is holding new perspectives, but also seeking perspectives. And as one of my professors at CIHS, and many of you know, uh, Dr. Sean S. Bjorn Hargens uh, likes to make sure that we're paying attention to integrating these perspectives. So he says that integralists are usually really good at holding perspectives, not as good at seeking perspectives, and we are still learning to integrate perspectives. So the fact that we can stand in multiple different versions of what might be going on is very good, but we also want to make sure that we're letting our guard down and letting our uh, implicit primacy of what we believe, letting that relax and really valuing someone else's perspective. And then when we have all these perspectives, what do we do with it so we can actually move forward? And then also incredibly important in integral, the lower left or the we domain, this is where ethics and the good arises. And this is where, of course, the gift of love naturally occurs. And the singularity that we are addressing in this domain is social division, the culture war, and we are currently, I believe, experiencing collapsing empires. So what a time to be alive. So many of you already have some examination thinking on the meta crisis, but I just want to frame some of the things that are arising in the meta crisis if you're not familiar with this as a as an orienting perspective. So this is also sometimes called the poly crisis. 
some of the things we're experiencing here is the meaning crisis. What does it mean to be a human in a post postmodern time? How do we actually experience personal meaning when everything is falling apart? How do we make any sort of sense of the ecological crisis? How do we engage in a world that is simultaneously supporting us that we are harming? How do I come into right relationship and right thinking about that? How do I come into a relationship with the capture and control dynamics? If any of you are familiar with the game A versus game B conversation, game B is sometimes framed as the infinite game. This is the win-win-win game where there's no end. We just get to be in the endless creative upward spiral versus game A, which is what is often experienced in modern culture, which is capture and control win-lose, um, and really power dynamics to keep others down so that the game A winners can climb. Obviously, there's more and more talk of nuclear threats, uh, oops, um, authoritarianism, and centralized opacity. Some people might consider centralized opacity what's called the deep state. Uh, I want to be careful about any rabbit holes of thinking, but it seems more and more that that is a conversation that's coming into the mainstream. And there's many other things that I could list here, AI, um, all sorts of runaway tech. Um, and my hope, my hope is that the conversations that we're having like this are leading to uh, a necessary cleansing action uh, and a, a reification of all the gifts of the first tier and clearly seeing the shadows that come with the excavation of those gifts so that we don't have to fall trapped to these shadows anymore and we can start to really amplify these gifts and move towards what has to be created next. So before I go too much farther, I just want to engage a question. And that question is, how have any of you been feeling the meta crisis? So I know it's easy to be in the thinking about the meta crisis, but I also want to engage our feeling bodies. And I want would love to hear how you're feeling about any of these things that are happening. So anyone who is called to share, would like to share anything from their heart, from their feeling body, please go ahead and raise your hand and then hop in and, and share. John, go ahead. I see your hand raised. Um, for me, the feeling has been disorientation, kind of like uh, questioning some basic assumptions of, you know, like what's up and down almost. It's been very, um, yeah, it's been, that's, that's probably the, yeah, in one word, it would just be very disorienting for me. Yeah. Thank you. Me too. Anyone else to share from the feeling body? Eloy. Um, when I'm in that feeling body, confusion and fear. Yeah. Yeah. You're not the only one. One of the energetic things that I'm consistently tracking is so social and cultural fields. And that fear whether it's because there's fear of financial collapse or there's fear of war, you know, the pain of watching what is happening around us, that is a very real thing in the collective. So just know if there's any of that concern, that anxiety that's happening, you're not the only one. We're here. We're all feeling it. Lynn. A lot of uh, argumentation arises from all of these confusing things and people clinging to their beliefs and absolutely having no tolerance for any conflicting beliefs. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I agree, Lynn. I experienced the same thing. And I think the, the less certainty people have, the more rigid they get with what they believe, because that's the only place, that's one of the places they find some sense of safety. Yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate the feedback. It helps me orient to how things are going. Okay. So 
reasons for the meta crisis. Why is this happening? How did we get here? What's going on? So I believe that we've created currently a culture in which we have a hierarchy of the I, the we, and the it. And we have chosen, in some sense chosen, I think also in some sense, it's just been an inherent feature of modernity that the it, the abstract, the objective has been the most valued thing in our culture and our society. But the challenge with that, and I'll show some reasons why for this at just a moment, the challenge with that is that we've extracted from the I and from the we in order to prop up and feed that it. So this really is demonstrated in how focused we are on tech and economic growth at the cost of family and relationship, emotional, mental, social, and cultural health. I think that if we look at advancement, if we look at progress, the progress of an iPhone or of AI or quantum computing has vastly outpaced the level of progress that we've made in families, in our own internal spaces, and in our social and cultural transformation. And that's costing us, and we're currently paying the price for that. Uh, one of the philosophers that Wilbur draws on, Jürgen Habermas, basically said that the it domain has colonized the I and the we spaces. So if we look at that idea of colonization, we've extracted energy and resource from the individual and from the collective to feed uh, corporations in their IP, in their products, in their generative uh, way of that they've been incentivized economically. We've extracted from the earth for sure, but we've also extracted from community and from culture. And people are primarily oriented to the reality through their usefulness to the it, to corporations and to technology. And it took me a long time to see that, but the more I look for it now, the more I see it more and more and more. There's an implicit assumption that we have to be oriented this way, and it's a survival-based assumption. And there's been a very, um, uh, I don't want to say a concerted effort, but a big movement to continue survival-based thinking through materialism, both scientific and consumer, uh, to keep us in a sort of hypnotism to the it perspective and hold it in such value while we've negated uh, a real value for cultivating the magic that happens in between people. Um, one of the, the philosophers and economists that I looked at, Anthony Giddens, who I believe is Sir Anthony Giddens in uh, Britain, calls this the juggernaut of modernity, this giant, massive social force that just keeps us barreling down what has become the wrong path. You know, it's not inherently, hasn't historically always been the wrong path, but I think we're veering off into a dangerous direction now. And we can see this all around us. And the singularity is not yet occurring in this we domain. So I'm suggesting that the singularity, this transformation is occurring mostly in the it domain, but not in the we domain. And it's the lagging domain because we've extracted from the I and the we in service of the it. So what's the answer here? How do we do post-capitalism? post-democracy, integral cities? What is the rectification of how we orient to each other as humans and recognize that we're the most important thing here? Not from a sense of egoic self-advancement, but from a sense of really engaging each other and engaging a, a healthy and interactive society. Um, oh yeah, let me make that last point really quick. So in... 2019 and 2020, I was partnering with um, some of you might know a program called Superhuman OS, which is an integral education course 
Um, and every month they held a, uh, a feature of that program called the Philosopher's Circle. And it was my great joy to host those calls. And I got to interview Ken actually 11 times over the course of those two years. And one of the questions that I asked Ken during that period was, we know the levels of development as they go through the personal domain. So through the upper left, through the eye experience, we know the, the uh, amber, the orange, the green, the teal. Is that, are we certain that that is the same in the lower left? Is it possible to skip levels? Like if the, the, the transformation in the upper left moved quickly enough, could we skip in the lower left? And he basically said, I don't know. We don't have enough research yet. So I am holding in my heart of hearts that we can skip to an integral society much more quickly than we anticipated. I don't know if that's true. I don't know if that can happen. I do know the culture wars for many of us who are sensitive to that are becoming basically unbearable. It's so challenging to watch all these factions scream at each other and that we really need to get to a place where we can experience and connect with each other in a deeper way. And so I'm hoping that just because the research isn't in doesn't mean that we have a long way to go before that teal culture can show itself. So I want to play, maybe not Nostradamus, but present a couple of what ifs because I want to um, examine what some of this runaway tech could create. And this isn't meant to be scary, um, but I want to sound the alarm on some things that could happen if we're not careful. So the first one is longevity medicine. I really think it's important that people live much longer. And simply for the fact, and I'll go a bit metaphysical here, that the amount of data and information and wisdom that we lose in the reincarnation process is becoming untenable. So living for 70, 80, 90 years, and then having to relearn all the things that we have to relearn as a human being in order to get to that level of wisdom again. I think if we were living 300 years and we didn't have to relearn some of those things, we might be able to make more progress as a culture. I don't know if that's true. But that's the way that I'm currently holding that. So if we have quantum computing, AI, gene modeling, regenerative medicine, and radical life extension, if we're looking at a 300-year healthy lifespan, what does that mean for the resources on the planet? To me, it essentially means we have to move from what's called a zero to a one culture, meaning we have to go from a single planet species to a multi-planet species just to have enough space and resource to support that. So there's a whole rabbit hole of thinking. I'll let you go down on your own. <laughs> Second one to examine is what I'm calling the meta bardo. So currently, video games are so addictive that people spend hours and hours and hours a day. What if we, again, add quantum computing, AI, real-time biometric tracking, on-demand, customized, chemical slow drip. So people are getting the neurotransmitters, the vitamins, the minerals that they need to support the neural states of the game that they're in, all happening through Neuralink. So you have brain-computer interface. And essentially, you have an AI creating an endless movie or video game that pe keeps people constantly engaged and at their own kind of... Uh, level of fascination, and they could disappear into that game essentially forever. That's scary. We want to be careful. And the Metabardo idea is what happens to that level? Are we actually creating a human tech level of reality where is a new realm that people are lost? And then last one, if we take these two previous ideas and essentially create a transhumanist cyborg aspect of reality, does that create a bifurcation of our species? Does our species split into two independent, different new species, where one is this new tech-oriented species and another is organic? 
Again, big thoughts. We don't have to go into too deeply here unless it's really compelling and we want to. Um, but those are possibilities I see in our future. So a quick frame on metaphysics. And without going down the doom and gloom rabbit hole, the question I'm asking is, what if all of this has to happen? Part of what we know happens at the second tier is a sprawl of perspectives, a sprawl of the way of being, a sprawl of how the universe plays through all of us. You want to listen again and not talk to me? Okay. okay. Thanks, Eli. Um, so if this if this has to happen, then we need to be stewards of this process and not exclude any of it and make sure that we are engaging the best and most beautiful and right aspects of it and stewarding it all back towards the collective good. The key here is if these developmental levels are really well-worn grooves in the cosmos and we're charting new grooves, we're cutting new grooves, we want to make sure that we are intentionally steering these new grooves in benevolent directions and that we're not bypassing any of these avenues that are getting explored and that we're also not creating uh, uh, challenging new backwaters for humanity to go down, that we've really got our critical lens on and we're asking the question that I don't think humanity is asking enough right now, which is, I know we can do this, but should we do this? This is very much my question in AI. AI is marching forward. I know that we can do it. I'm not sure if we should do it. So we get to ask, what are the gifts of this crisis? Well, I hope it's connection. I hope it's meetings like this and conversations like this, where we get to ask this should question, what's happening in our feeling body? What's happening in our spiritual insight? What's happening in our heart of hearts? And how can we co-inform each other to land in more clarity, more co-evolution, more strength and capability, and more openness and lovingness? So... I want to ask this why entrepreneurs question, but I want to engage any entrepreneurs in the space first and ask this question before I answer it. What role do any of you think that entrepreneurs have to play in this big meta crisis, this big thing that we're all engaging? I'm curious to hear from all of you and to co-inform the space and to uh, uh, crowdsource wisdom. Yes, Birgit. Um, we need mindful leaders. We need people who are leading consciously, responsible, mindful, and inspire others. Yeah. And entrepreneurs are one of them. Totally agree. I know you're one of them. Thank you so much. <laughs> Lynn, I saw your hand up. Yes, I, I absolutely agree with Brigitte and just um, entrepreneurs can become incredible thought leaders like yourself and other people who are just examining the deeper issues that are happening around the meta crisis and like in some senses creating, you know, we could call it subcultures and as those uh, as that consciousness gets wider and um, these entrepreneurs grow into even wealth and leadership that can funnel down to uh, many more people in our population. Um, so hopefully we'll see what happens because the world needs a lot of healing right now. Amen. Let's do it. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. John and Carrie. Hey, Matt. Um... Hey. I was just feeling into the benevolent use of resources, uh, wealth in particular, and whose hands is that wealth and resource in, whose has it been in, and uh, who does it need to be in, and how do we use that wealth benevolently for our growth and evolution, and where that resource is placed in terms of where we're headed. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think the reclamation of what wealth is and what it must be is a huge area that's ripe for investigation. Yeah, thanks. Tom. No, oh, John, two, sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, as well as that, um, we have a responsibility, I believe, that um, as entrepreneurs, creatives, and founders to tap into what our purpose is and align with purpose and divine will in our lives as best as, as best as we can so that as we encounter all of these situations in in this planet um you know we're able to do it from a place of of um you know true insight and yeah. I, I think that's what will help yeah help things forward better <laughs> Amen. Yeah, we can't we can't hide from the call of spirit moving through us. That's got to be one of the voices in action. Yeah, Tom. You know what I think is going to save us is this seems like the final gasp of junk and stuff. I love that. What people are responding to is the state experience of the subtle. And you can buy all the junk and stuff you want. It's just not going to give you that transformational experience. So even though the it's are running, you can feel people, whether it's this community, gravitating to the state that we experience or anywhere. And it seems like the last gaps, you know, the last tricks of the junk and stuff movement before people wake up and adopt something a lot more connected. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on, I'm on that team. Let's do that one. <laughs> Larry, go ahead. Yeah. To your earlier point about how the, the, the I and the we has been subjugated to the it. I think any integralist entrepreneur, it's important to keep aware of the framework of the four quadrants, the external and the internal, because it's such a focus historically last 40 years, 50 years, especially has been on the external, like you were saying earlier. And how can an, an integralist entrepreneur be more aware of how to serve the left-hand quadrants as just not just the right-hand quadrants or not dominating with the right-hand quadrants. And not that that's an easy thing to do for sure, but it's to your point that I think all quadrants need to be served in a healthy kind of way. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I, I love the idea of businesses truly animated by entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs animated by spirit. Like bringing mm -hmm. that whole stack, I think, is going to be part of how we need to address all of this. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for voices in. I really appreciate it. So my uh, my sense here is that in... The integral space, the the way that integral has really engaged um, business has been from a corporate space. So many of you who are familiar with the integral corpus know um, Frederick Lalou and Robert Keegan and Raj Sasodia. So um, some of these books that are kind of the teal organization framework really look at corporations and large organizations. And Entrepreneurship is actually a little different. While entrepreneurs started all those businesses, entrepreneurs exist at a much uh, uh, at lower scale, most of them do in terms of the startup. So there's a lot of entrepreneurship happening that isn't at that big corporate level. And I don't think this has been well addressed in the integral space. And so this entrepreneurial spirit has to be steered in a very different way. So entrepreneurs are decision makers and they drive the kind of uh, orientation that the company takes. So if we address the, this at the entrepreneurial level, it's going to inspire everything that occurs within that organization as it goes from startup all the way into something larger, or even just the small business, which we all know is kind of the backbone of our economy anyway. And the truth is that most people within corporations are not likely to be second tier oriented. They go into corporations because they want to have that safety and security. And so they tend to be orange and often green. And so we can't leave it up to them to come up with these second tier perspectives. It's really the entrepreneur, the founder 
that needs to imbue these philosophies and these perspectives into the business. So the business is uh, making sure that everything that it touches is to the best of its ability integral. And in that way, it will invite those who are not yet integral, who are just working within these organizations up into uh, more advanced perspectives, more growth orientation, and give them the opportunity to go on this integral journey on their own. Entrepreneurs are inherently developmental because they get faced with a lot of chaos and intensity and a lot of fear, and they need developmental tools. So I've seen over and over that when entrepreneurs and founders find integral, even if it's just for the gift of understanding other people, they really are looking for that tool set. Um, and they're on the hero's journey. I believe spiritual entrepreneurship is a hero's journey. And this is a big one speaking to what you were mentioning, Carrie, about the, the money and the resource and the finance side of it. If we can create businesses that are deeply caring and deeply transformational and really oriented to more benevolence, that incentivizes both the business to succeed, but also the markets that the business touches to support those organizations that value connection and value second tier perspectives and are doing good in the world. So the entrepreneur actually wins and there's research to support this. If you read any of the conscious capitalism material that over the longer arc that the B corporations and those who are motivated by creating collective good are actually incentivized and do much better on orders of magnitude financially versus those that are purely extractive and working on older orange and even green paradigms. So the incentivization from a financial perspective is there. And then most of you know, if you have worked in any sort of integral level organization, it's just more fun. It's more fun to have more control and more say and be doing it together. Um, so the way that I see this is that the organization, the corporation, the integral is might be like the trunk of the tree and it's arboreal. So there's one big movement and the people in the organization are like the leaves of the tree, but the integral entrepreneurs are mycelial. They're in the ground. They're the kind of the fungal network that is connecting everything and sharing resources, sharing intelligence, sharing wisdom and sharing ways that we can all lift each other up and moistening the soil and making it really fertile so that more more and more people can succeed. So the way that I see this and the concept and frame that I've been working on here is that integral entrepreneurs create BGEs, which are benevolence generating engines. And this is building a business from philosophical first principles first. And as you know, this isn't mine. The goodness, the truth, and the beauty are the three gifts of the I, the we, and the it. This is Platonic philosophy and probably Hermetic, you know, ancient Egyptian, and probably even something before that. So this has been with us for millennia. And if we really oriented our businesses towards this, if we discovered what we this meant for us as entrepreneurs and founders, there's a very different way to build businesses. So we get to ask questions like, what does post-growth goodness look like in your business? How truthful and transparent are you in your business? And how much beauty beyond the branding but beauty in the sense that you're actually generating flourishing of your clients and your communities and the people that you're touching, that they are blossoming because they've come in contact with your business. How much of that are you oriented to? And then as more of these businesses start to communicate and connect and make webs of benevolence, this is what I've essentially been endeavoring to do in all the businesses that I'm creating. So I won't go into all these at the moment, but these conversations I like to have because it connects me with other people who are on the same integral impulse and want to build vehicles of the integral message and the second tier message and this uh, kind of impulse towards benevolence and let these vehicles of business do this work so that we can scale the impact out in the world. So three simple examples of how we could apply this. So this GTB, goodness, truth, beauty, 
and the W3 is the win-win-win. So the GTB W3 is my entire orientation towards business. We can build businesses based on these philosophical fundamentals, and we can do quarterly assessments on how well we're doing. We can set subjective, intersubjective, and objective outcomes, and then move our business more and more towards that. We can check our capacity for perspective taking, seeking, and coordinating. And how does that inform our culture? How does it inform our success? And then lastly, we can act as ethical whistleblowers, sounding the alarm in your industry for businesses that have become purely extractive, businesses that are doing harm. This is not the old boys club anymore. We need to be not uh, tattletales, but stewards of what's happening in our markets and make sure that those who are moving in non-benevolent directions are uh, not allowed to continue to extract and take away from the I and the we for the good of the it. So time for breakout. Here we go. This is our moment to connect. <laughs> so the breakout question, uh, and Eloy, I'm not sure if you want me to make the, the groups or if you would like to do that. Um, but the question is, uh, what elements of the meta crisis have captured your attention and what do you believe needs to happen? And again, these are some of the things that are showing up in the meta crisis, the ecological and climate situation, social fragmentation, the elite wealth gap, war, corporatocracy, captured capitalism, government overreach, the collapses in health, AI and tech. You could probably name 10 more if you wanted to. So um, we'll take this into the breakout groups. And um, I think let's do given time about 15 minutes um, where you'll all, all get to bask in the joy and the brightness of each other's wisdom. And let's uh, go into these groups and create all the solutions that humanity needs and solve this meta crisis right here today. How about that? <laughs> Breakout sessions are not recorded. Eloy, is that everyone? We're all back. Okay. That's a thumbs up. Awesome. Um, so I'd love to hear what were a couple of inspiring things that came out of the groups. What 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 uh what it, it brightened your your experience? What did you take away? What did you love? Less judgment, more acceptance. Love that. Thanks, Joshua. Presence to what? is right in front of us and the big ideas and concepts and global agendas and intentions nice thoughts but what's right what's right in front of us <laughs> in the devotion to what is right here right now thanks larry um, on the other side of great fear is great trust mm. yep been led through that lesson a couple times anyone else yeah, part of that notion is what's right in front of us, not in terms of outside of our eyes, but what's behind our eyes. Amen. If you're not acting, if you're not engaged, right, in the world, right, not just in your local world, but in the global world, because the earth is our earth, right, then you're not present. You get mm. it? You can't say you're present and you live in your little, tiny, petty little world. Right? The world, you are the world, and the world is you. There is no division, there is no separation. And when you are present, you are responsible. You are responding to what is happening. So, I yes, clarify. Yes. And with gusto and vigor and animation, thank you for that. I feel yes. you. Bursting <laughs> with energy. Yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. Any other shares before we hop into a few more slides? I think about the promise of the liminal space and how when you're in there, it's like it, it, it's ready to move forward. You know, it's mm -hmm. like you went in there because you want to you chose to go there and uh, and then you chose it because you want to, you know, you want that next step that it's going to bring. 
Yeah, I love that perspective, Phyllis. It's like when I feel that liminal space, it's like it's bursting at the seams with so much of wants, what wants to come forward. I completely agree. Thank you. Got, got one more for you, Matt. And Great. Look, like just looking at the list, I was like, I could look at it intellectually, I could look at it emotionally, but suddenly it became a call to action. Like these are not just things to ponder or consider or feel, but to act on. Yeah. Mm. I was just sharing a post on uh, social media that I believe that we are responsible to the greatest level of our own awakening. So if we've awakened to the oneness, then what is our responsibility to the oneness? And for me, that was a very confronting question because it felt very big. And over time, I managed to get it to a, a version that I could work. But it, that question has been very active in me. Eloy, thank you for that. Okay. I'm going to share a few more slides. We're, so we're going to pivot now into some of the... Um, how does a spiritual entrepreneur relate to all this? Because there's some specific features of spirituality and entrepreneurship that go together very well. And I believe it's those who have had awakenings that have a role in the entrepreneurial conversation and they specifically need support. They need lifting up, they need perspectives and they need each other. They need to operate in this we in order to be the vanguard, the people at the leading edge, the tip of the spear, as they say, in order to pierce the markets with all the goodness and truth and beauty that they hold in their hearts. So we'll share a screen again. And we'll start here. Great. So the question is, why are spiritual entrepreneurs generally less successful than traditional entrepreneurs? I've seen this over the past 12, 13 years be true that the most amazing entrepreneurs with truly wonderful gifts coming from their spiritual practices and their deep awakening with such amazing things to give, just struggle. And that all entrepreneurs struggle. But the people who are the most quote unquote successful by the standard definitions of whatever successful means, and of course that's gonna be different for you and for everyone individually, subjectively, but for the way that most people would define success, spiritual entrepreneurs, for all the gifts that they have, don't tend to fall into that camp. So why is that? A couple of thoughts here. So we wanna look at this from a developmental lens. So as all of you know, this is the big integral map. And this is probably an okay place to, to share the big integral map. I know a lot of times people pull up this map and then this is what they start to look like. They get so excited. They get so amped up. They get so embroiled in their own fascination that they end up down the rabbit hole of what integral is. And so I don't want to go through the whole map. Most of you know the map. I want to go through just a few levels and look at what happens in consciousness in these levels and also talk about what happens in business in terms of structures from these levels. So as you know, we're going to, this isn't all the levels. We're just going to look at these four. Amber, traditional rule role, classical conservatives, pre-logical belief structures, Orange, very motivated, success-oriented, logical, rational, scientific, and tend to be anti-religious, anti-spiritual. This is the level in which the great enlightenment, the philosophical enlightenment arose. Green, feeling, emotion-centered, care, inclusion, multiculturalism, equality, justice, reinvoking spirituality, and tend to be anti-hierarchical. And then teal in the second tier, valuing multiple perspectives, service to humanity, a systems orientation, holds and values complexity, and accepts where others are at. Now, I've also looked at this from a business perspective. So the amber level of business tends to be a service that's a, a service to community. They're fulfilling a role, and this is the mom and pop shop. This doesn't mean it has to be a small business in terms of revenue. This can actually grow to be quite a big business, and they'll move into orange as they do that. Um, but most amber businesses, I think of like the classic uh, hardware store in a small town. 
that would be an orientation to business from an amber perspective. Corporations tend to come into play from people at orange levels development. They want to build something that is very, can be very big. Uh, and a corporate context is a bucket in which they can put their entrepreneurial spirit to grow something that can be very big. I would say the type of business that arose at green would be the nonprofit or the NGO. Uh, even nonprofit is a term that belies the perspective that profit is bad, which is a rejection of orange. And so that, of course, is the way that business is done at the second tier. Now, I would say that half of B Corps exist at that level and the other half exist at Teal. B Corps in their, this is a benefit corporation, so a, comp a company that has a, a corporate structure but in their bylaws can take actions that do not just serve the shareholder value. Orange corporations have to serve shareholder value. B corporations can serve planetary value and have other values that they serve. Um, but still in expression, the way I see them operating most of the time, the ethics and the, the conversation tend to be often a very green conversation. So given that, what does that mean about markets? Now, what I've come to understand is that in the culture, in the population, still the biggest percentage of the way that we operate in our cultures is an orange level of development. And so all of our markets, all of our economies, all of our governance prioritize all of the values that exist at orange. And under the bell curve of the uh, population distribution, there seems to be mostly orange and amber with a very healthy chunk of green and not too much teal. So the reason that this is important is that if this is the center mass of the culture, if most of the rules of the culture and of markets and uh, of economies are built on orange perspectives, and most of the spiritual entrepreneurs that we're talking about have surpassed that, we run into a scenario that the markets and the economies and the businesses are actually not as easy for spiritual entrepreneurs to exist in. Now, these markets don't exclude anyone, but they're not designed for them. Because orange and teal are going to be more sensitive, they're going to be more complex, they're going to be embracing more, there's going to be a sense of drag when they have to operate in orange environments, in orange markets, and in orange uh, tactics because they have to compete in the market. And so it takes more energy for people who are in green and teal and beyond to operate in orange businesses. And as a result, this is one of the reasons I've seen that they're not as successful because it actually requires more energy for them to do it. And simultaneously, you know, in green, there is a rejection of orange because any level that we've recently transcended, we tend to reject until we go to teal. And then there's a whole big cleanup of reclaiming the way of being in a market that is important to, um, to reorienting towards orange but it requires a refocusing of how we uh, move our business in an orange market. So a types perspective, looking at how entrepreneurs, spiritual entrepreneurs be, what are some of the personality characteristics of people who are green and teal and oriented towards spiritual type businesses? They tend to be, as an example, more inward oriented and intuitive and feeling types. In the MBTI, this would be that intuitive feeling. They tend to be sensitive. So whether that's empathically sensitive or interpersonally sensitive, there tends to be more of that sensation in the body, in the heart, in the energy bodies that they have to be responsible for. Then people in orange tend, not always, but tend not to have to contend with that. They also typically have a higher value on ethical interaction than people who are traditional corporate climbers. And they tend to be helpers. So 
this is the conversation I'm usually having, having with coaches, healers, people in the wellness space, uh, and also founders and entrepreneurs and other domains. Uh, but they are very focused on wanting everyone to get the help that they need. And they orient towards um, connection over personal benefit. So they will uh, rob the banks of their own energy and well-being in order to serve others. And so they end up with an empty cup in order to create benefit for other people. And as you know, that's really hard to do for a sustained period of time, and they end up crashing. So relationships of care, very easy. Relationships of transaction, very hard for them. So you're starting to see a picture here of why this becomes really challenging for people to operate in markets where uh, someone from an orange level of development doesn't have all these extra considerations. Uh, we also want to just look at this from a quick states lens because spiritual entrepreneurs tend to be on this ascendant awakening path. So they're moving up through the subtle the causal, the witness towards the non-dual. And there's many gifts that turn on from that place. And that gifts, those gifts are really amazing for them as practitioners within their business. So giving the service of their business is something that they become masterful at. But being an entrepreneur who runs the business actually tends to disadvantage them because they tend to float. They tend to be a little ungrounded, a little lost in the non-dual. Um, it's really hard to sit down and do the accounting. And this is consistent with Jeffrey Martin's work from um, his research on the finders. Some of you may be familiar with this book uh, called The Finders from Jeffrey Martin. Um, he did a whole bunch of research to look at people on the spiritual awakening path. And what he found was... Um, there's a whole subset of the population in the spiritual awakening that when they get to a certain point, I'm going to paraphrase this and probably not do it its service, but they tend to not be as capable and useful as a human being on the planet. They tend to be non-attached. They tend to be a little disconnected. They tend not to be as focused on task-oriented things. And because of that, it's really hard for them to be as focused and tenacious as it requires to be in business. So what I've started to have the conversation with people around is if this is historically an ascendant path of awakening, how do we re-engage an imminent path? and use the brightness of that awakening to pull ourselves back down onto the planet and hold on to that awakening and the brightness and go back there in our meditation and go back there in our retreat, but in our business to amplify that light out into the world and use our business as a devotional practice. So if you've ever been on retreat, you know, there's moments on retreat where you're cleaning the dishes and where you're sweeping up. And the goal is to hold the brightness that you cultivated on the meditation cushion in that moment. But as entrepreneurs, we could also be doing that as we're marketing and as we're accounting and as we're in the moment to moment day to day practices that we need to be doing. We can use business as a way to express our care and our love for humanity to build a vehicle that actually serves humanity. So we're going to touch again on the big three. We talked about this as the I, the we, and the it. The big three are essentially how we create realms. It's how, you know, everything in this gross realm is an I, a we, or an it without exclusion. In business, this is looked at as uh, in the same way, but the I is the entrepreneur, the we is the client or the cohort or the collective that you serve, and the it is the offer. It's that thing that you create to give away in the world. So I love this as a way for entrepreneurs to orient to how they do business because you can start to use this as a heuristic to understand what's happening or not happening in your business uh, and understanding that everything essentially comes down to the interaction of the entrepreneur, the client, 
and the offer. And this will scale as the business gets bigger. So, you know, if you have a, a company of 200 people, the we might be the team or the internal culture and the it might be the um, the policy that the culture interacts on. Um, but there will always be these three domains that are enacted in our business. I want to pull from a non-integral, uh, well, it is an integral model, but it is not integral theory. It's a, a system, a philosophy called the Imminent Metaphysics by Forrest Landry. And it is also a very beautiful philosophy. And Forrest says that there are three types of relationships that we navigate in our life. They are relationships of care, relationships of power, and relationships of transaction. Now, if you look at a traditional business in Orange selling any sort of widget, they're primarily focused on care or on power and transaction. And I would say probably in the opposite order, transaction and then power. So it's all about selling as many widgets and they'll care just enough to get the transaction to happen. So they are advantaged in the marketplace by doing that. Spiritual entrepreneurs are the opposite. They want to center care, but they have to also recognize that these other two types of relationships have to be enacted. And I've seen so many spiritual entrepreneurs who will jettison their power. And people are coming to you because you have in this specific domain that they want your help in, you have more power than they do. So recognizing that there is a gradient of power that is important to enact if we have sufficient care. And if care and power are addressed, now we can engage transaction. Now transaction actually feels delightful and feels good. Now transaction is a way to commit to the transformation and it is exalted. It's not a dirty word. It's not a bad thing. And money becomes the vehicle of that exchange and it's in right relationship to a conscious interaction. So one of the things I would love spiritual entrepreneurs to learn and understand is that their care must be bolstered by their reclamation of right relationship to power and the the exaltation, the lifting up of transaction and the sale as a way to agree to the higher self that we both want to see, both the client and the entrepreneur want to enact through this process. So um, that was a lot. I've got just a couple more solutions here before we finish up. So I want to stop for just a moment. There was a lot of data there, thoughts, feelings, noticings, what's arising in your experience. Tell me what you're, what you're in the presence to in your own experience. Matt, your category of power, could that also be like competence slash quality? Yes. Yes, exactly right. Because the way that I'm holding power, and, and Wilbur talks about this, right? It's not power over. This is not a uh, uh, that type of hierarchy. It's a hierarchy of liberating power. And that power is the thing that people are seeking us for. So that competency is one of the ways that we demonstrate that power. Awesome question. Thank you. Seems like there would be an element of love in all of those too, like in the transaction, not just money transaction, but love and power with love and yeah, in, in the in the metaphysics, the love is enacted in the care. And once the care is fundamental, that it will pervade everything else that's occurring. So it will pervade the 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 transaction as well as the interaction and 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 interplay of power. But once that is occurring, the love, now everything gets energized. Somehow um I was thinking of a sales call I get over the weekend. And the first thing they try to do is care. <laughs> Disingenuous this disingenuousness of it just aggravates the hell out of me. So when it's done badly, it, it's really not good. Did did you feel that it was because it was disingenuous? Like did yes. they not? Okay, got it. Yeah. So it was transactional care. 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure how they could have did it genuinely, like perhaps call and say, I'm sorry, I'm really bothering you. I'll let you go right away. Oh, oh, got it. So it was like a uh, like a robocaller or something like that. That's funny. Yeah, Lynn, go ahead. I have this conflicting kind of something or other going on. And that is I'm looking at a highly successful business that offers quite a service called Amazon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my little, my little grocery store, uh, uh, um, Trader Joe's creates these wonderful products and also the local co-op um create these wonderful products they sell them for a while and then they discontinue them and i go to amazon and there they are at a reasonable price and yet i know that amazon has wiped out a lot of small businesses and i don't want to contribute to that however if i want that planet soap i'll go to amazon it's quick it's easy they're going to deliver it to me in 24 hours they just have a very good system there but I'm really, there's a conflict going on here that I'm not comfortable with. Yeah, thank you for positioning that. And I think that's, it's an important contemplation for all of us to find our right relationship to these three elements. I'm, I'm positioning care as first. And I think that that most of the time should be true. But similar to what Tom was saying, if I'm stopping in the gas station to buy a pack of gum, do I want to make sure I've got a lifelong commitment to this guy behind the counter? Like, should there be that much care? That's probably over overdoing it a little bit. You know, sometimes transaction for transaction's sake is completely fine. But we want to make sure that all three of those are in the conversation. And so I really appreciate what you're saying, Lynn, is you know, like how do we how do we navigate and find a right relationship to all three of these elements? You know, forces us to look at our own values and how much do we place care as a value over transaction and convenience. Brigitte, you yeah. got a hand up? Yeah, Brigitte. I wanted to comment on Larry's, uh, you know, competence versus power. And I realized that one, one way towards the competence from the entrepreneurship is to create so to create pull over pressure so to create mm. a suction so like a like a like a like a because the, the conventional entrepreneurs are from a world where pressure is forming diamonds which mm -hmm. is the most <laughs> horrible sentence I, I i always felt this sentence to be the most horrible one well, I can deal with grosses out of comfort, out of the comfort zone, but not the diamond stuff. So pressure is the traditional way and pull, like you really make the people wanting to come to you because you have the competence, you, 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 you evaporate the competence and that makes the pull of it. Yeah. Yeah. I I think what I hear you saying this is, is the right wording, you know, no, I'm still not native. So it's suction, pull, all that, you know, getting yeah. people towards you. I, I sometimes say magnetic, like how, how do you make your messaging and your marketing magnetic so that people feel your heart in what you're saying? Um, and it's, it's actually, I, I like the term for me because it's a bit metaphysical that your message rings like a bell, you know, so everyone wants to come to the bell to, to hear how beautiful it is. And, and maybe there's dinner there too. That would be nice. Um, but that magnetism, I think is what I hear you saying. Awesome. Yeah, Phyllis. Oh, you're still muted. A little bit of trouble with the term spiritual entrepreneur, because in a lot of ways, it seems like um, it's a contradiction. And, um, and uh, the concern that I keep kind of rubbing up on is that someone who's really taken a spiritual path as their life's work is not likely to have that skill set to deal with the transactional and the power piece. So is there a place rather than looking at them as 
two separate things, traditional entrepreneurship and a spiritual um, uh, side to that, the need for um, for that to be part of the we space and for a, a caring corporation to have people who are both to have people who have you know that wh whose role is to bring that spirituality into the business um, and that caring into the business, but also have a traditional entrepreneur who um, where both are open to each other. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, uh, first of all, thank you for the question. It's very insightful. And at the integral level, there should be that spread. We should have multiple iterations of all of these kind of co-informing. There should be a weave and a web of every iteration that needs to arise. So yes, could a spiritual entrepreneur or a spiritual person have a role within an organization that is conscious and elevated set of ethics in which they are thriving and supported? I absolutely want to see that happen. Um, could a spiritual entrepreneur create a team of practitioners and hire spiritual people to deliver the service? Yes, I absolutely want to see that happen. You know, this is this is mix and match. We get to create our own journey here. So whatever flavor most serves people, I, I'm not suggesting that if you're spiritual, you should exit being an employee and go start a business. I'm just presenting for those who do desire to to kind of cut their own groove of considerations that they might want to have in order to do that. Thanks, Phyllis. Tom. So I had an experience just this week where uh, Liz Cheney has been in the news because she wrote a book. And like a few years ago, I would have been like so uninterested in what she had to say. But what raised her to a level of my interest is she came across as caring. Like she elevated or she prioritized caring in her message way above other aspects of transaction or power, politics, any of that. And in my, I haven't read her book, so maybe I am wrong in making assumptions about it. But what came alive for me is that, oh, she really is a caring person and she cares a lot in the same way that I care about things, even though politically we wouldn't necessarily agree on a lot of policies and a lot of specifics. Um, I don't think we would agree at all. But I saw her as a caring person, and so I was now interested in her message of mm. what she had to say because she really elevated that. And so I think it goes with her your three levels of transaction. Mm. That's, that's what I came up with. Yeah, beautiful. I love that. And there's there's a few ways that I've seen people engage that. So a couple of things come to mind. One is um, when care is established, disagreement is much easier. So, you know, that opportunity to say, you're great. I just think you're crazy. Let's be friends. You know, like there, that really becomes a reality, which is awesome. Um, and then the other tricky one, which is where discernment becomes so, so important is what I call weaponized care. So that narcissistic tendency to say all the right things and put on the right face, but it's really still transaction and power. So we as integralists, as waking people have to watch for that thing because that sometimes happens. But yeah, I, I love that watching people who we would have disagreed with take that caring step. And it's like, ah, oh, so nice to meet you here. <laughs> Thank you. Lynn. Oh, I just was um thinking about <clears throat> the two words, spiritual entrepreneur and then I started to think about people who I respect and admire um, because they lead with deep kindness, like Thich Nhat Hanh or Pima Chodron. I love Pima Chodron and Tara Brock and other people who have incredible wisdom and really share such kindness with the world. And then I just, just thought, wow, they're all entrepreneurs. <laughs> so yep. the two go hand in hand and that's, you know, genuine, genuine power. Um, so I think the, the word is the phrase spiritual entrepreneur is a good one. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I, one of my dear friends and clients does a lot of the marketing for some of those corporations through Sounds True, the organization that puts out a lot of books and the, the Buddhist um, side of things. So it's really fun to watch through her eyes how she crafts marketing for spirituality. It's really interesting and compelling. Um, so yeah, thank you for that. Okay. Anyone else before we take it home with this, the last couple of slides here? Yeah, beautiful. All right. So here's my recommendations for those who are entrepreneurial, looking at the meta crisis, perhaps on a spiritual path. First is to be neurologically nimble. That means how do we have enough capacity in our nervous system to handle the complexity to handle all the dynamics that arise? How do we do the training to keep ourselves uh, grounded and open and centered and safe enough that we can handle everything that's going on around us? So as Wilbur says, the taller the ladder, the more it sways. And really this is about expanding your capacity for novelty. This is right in line with the awakening path to just be present to what is right now. How do we in our mind and in our practice as consumers, because we all will be consumers, uh, how do we unhook materialism? So how do we start to value and place the center of our value in something very different? And I believe this is really the mind virus of modernity. The materialism is just such a easy way to get us entranced into the gross realm and forget what is probably for most of us, really valuable and important. Connection, love, care, and transcendence. Third, be evolutionarily evocative. So by the nature of who you are, by the nature of how you be, invite others into their own evolution. So just from your own groundedness and rootedness and care, the brightness of your smile, the luminousness of your spirit, let others be in the inquiry, in, inquiry of how you are that way, which invites them into their own self-examination. Number four, decide if you are an entrepreneur, how you want to start to incorporate some of these goodness, truth, and beauty as fundamental values and win-win-win as decision-making uh, processes. How might you just take one or two steps to start to incorporate these into your business? Flip the triple. So this is a cute way of me saying, let's stop prioritizing the it by extracting from the I and the we. Let's prioritize the we and support the I and let the it, the tech, the material, all the things that we've spent hundreds of years creating, let's let all those things support us now. Um, be a comprehensive generalist. So we've lived through a time of too many uh, specialists that have created silos of thinking. And this is one of my favorite things about Integral is that we like to use models of thinking across multiple domains. That's part of how we create webs of connection. It's part of how we create communities. And it's a part of how we create robust examinations of how we properly and ethically engage in the world. And then last couple here, this is to what Tom was speaking to earlier. And this is a devotion to what is real over what is true. And by what is real, I mean that thing that lights us up, that thing that can only come from the I, that is not abstracted in the mind alone, that is in communion with nature and with other people, that very real and visceral experience that lights up your neurology and wakens your spirit. Um, beware the metabardo, we talked about that, and moving towards protopias instead of idealistic utopias. We can talk about that if anyone's interested. Be a business bodhisattva. So for those in the Buddhist lineage, a bodhisattva is a person who's committed to the awakening of all beings. So 
how can our business be in service to the awakening of one form or another of those that we serve and everyone that the business touches? And then lastly, this is a quote that I looked for hours for the attribution for, so I don't have. So my apologies, it came up in a conversation I was having with someone. And essentially the quote is, when the flood came, I did not run. And I believe that's the moment we're in now. The flood of complexity is coming. It's happening. The flood of confusion and chaos and division and strife is happening. And one of the reasons I'm so grateful for and love the integral community is that we're the ones that stay. We're the ones that stand. We're the ones that stay in the inquiry, that ask the questions, that be here with an open heart. And I think that is the critical feature of what needs to happen in our culture in order for us to successfully navigate the madness of this moment that we're in. So that's that. Resources for you. Um, the two versions of this talk are both up on YouTube. This talk, as Eloy said, will be up on YouTube in a couple of days. And there is also, I have, if anyone's interested more in this conversation, there's a free group that I've put together of entrepreneurs who are in this inquiry. There's a whole bunch of content in there. You're welcome to come and participate. There's no push, there's no sell. It's all just creating community. So those are ways that we can further engage. I just wanna say thank you for this space to be in my expression and for your deep listening of both your mind and heart. Thank you for being in this caring and loving space. This is important stuff. And uh, I feel less alone having been here with you today. Thank you, Matt. I think uh, I speak for a lot of people. The presentation was outstanding today. And hopefully Eloy could um, put some of that contact information up in, in the chat. But thank you very much for that. Um, it was very enlightening. So we've come to the end of our time. I want to remind everyone that January 13th, 2024 will be our next presentation. And hopefully Matt joins us and can be here with us. So RSVP uh, as quick as you can. And the speaker will be Jeff Snyder. Watch for the information on uh, what he will be talking about. Um, remember, you can make donations on any one of our websites. And please uh, make a donation to ICON. I'll put that up in the chat pretty soon uh, so that we can do it. Um, so we're moving into the informal segment right now. And I thought I'd share a couple of thoughts. I love the nine solutions that you came up with in the end. I think it summarizes some of the best that Integral has to offer. But throughout this talk, I was constantly thinking, to use your words, Matt, why the flood of chaos right now? And I don't know what we were thinking with the transition to second tier was going to entail. But as I looked at his diagram on orange being in the middle of the bell curve, what struck me is amber or blue just beneath it has been on the criticism since the Renaissance. Green is getting taken apart at the political level by Wilbur and everything. And when COVID hit, people started to say, it's not worth it anymore. I don't wanna work that hard. Community has been more important to me. And so even though it still is the main narrative, it feels like um, the advent of second tier is finally going off the giant in the room, the orange sensibilities. And it is a bit ugly and chaotic as we move into second tier 
because there there isn't enough organizing um, and structure yet where we're going to integrate all these levels. So that really struck me uh, going on as Matt was presenting it from the perspective of the entrepreneur. Um, so with that said, we're going to try to get the dialogue. Feel free to just unmute yourself and speak up and let's see what has hit each of you. Bye, 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 Brigitte. Brigitte. <laughs> So I had put in the chat just before to finish the um, where you I've been thinking about the Bodhisattva thing and then it I put the the, the phrase Bodhisattva Ninja because it's it seems like more than just having that intention and that practice but where there's some more skills involved and um, more traction than just being a Bodhisattva. You know, Matt, I was appreciating um, the fact that you had uh, you had included the uh, imminent path or the descending path, and uh, you didn't just include it as a concept, but you talked about you know feeling, and you talked about gross realm, and you talked about uh, or you actually had a center of practice of you know breathing, just a simple practice of breathing into our bodies, and I'm noticing that the descending path helps me feel. Um, more connected in the gross realm, you know, the body felt sensing, and that that's something that's been missing for me. And I'm just valuing that you brought that up. So much my pleasure. Thank you. Matt, may I selfishly ask you for your perspective on permaculture, please? Yes, more a uh, specific question within permaculture or just as a general? I'm uh, going, have been moving through a career change um, away from web design, marketing, mm -hmm. um, sitting in front of a computer for uh, <laughs> extended periods of time uh, to um, I was contemplating moving into AI machine learning, but mm. realizing that, well, I'm going to be sitting in front of a computer for nine hours again, um, not necessarily is going to result in a healthy human being. Um, so where I'm currently thinking of, of moving is towards uh, permaculture um, because it will require me to understand the world through systems thinking um, uh, at a higher level of complexity. However, there is concerns that it's moving backwards. <laughs> moving towards farming seems um, counterintuitive to the direction that um, the it is moving. So I'm just curious to uh, see things from your perspective. Um, yeah, thank you for that. I'll, I'll share. It's not my my area of expertise. I'll share a couple things and it will open up because I'm sure there's a couple other people who have voices here to share in. So yes, the the it is going in this direction, but it's also more abstracted and less real. Permaculture is a different direction, but I think fundamentally far more real. And I think as technology and people, corporate farming, all that stuff moves in one direction, People who want to have very real experiences of themselves, of the earth, and of each other are going to start to head in the same direction as permaculture, regenerative farming, you know, all of those types of ways of actually being a very real human being on the earth. Um, there's also, there's been a few conversations with Intergolus that I've had where they've said that they believe that the aspects of the first tier will get enacted in the second tier. And one of the ways that we have to do that is re-engage a right orientation to tribalism. 
not the tribalism that we're seeing politically, but how do we band together in small groups and actually come into right relationship with where we exist as human beings on the land? So I think that permaculture and regenerative farming have a huge role to play in that. So while it might not be a technologically sexy move, I would say if it lights your spirit up, that there's probably a very real examination that needs to happen there. Um, and there's a book I would recommend by a person I mentioned earlier in the talk, Sean S. Bjorn Hargens wrote a great book called Integral Ecology. So if you're looking for advanced perspectives around ecology, that would be a great place to start. You kind of had a throwaway at the beginning about um, multiple planetary life um, in your in your piece about living to be three hundred, and uh, which all uh, in a way goes, no, I don't want to live to three hundred. But um, but in terms of moving to multiple planets, so many of the things that seem terrifying right now, like AI, like, you know, um, this technological, you know, like uh, explosion that, that we as human beings haven't quite yet caught up to in terms of our own personal evolution. It seems that if that's a direction that you think is viable direction, we need, AI. We need, um, you know, human um, cyborg interfaces, and and because um, that's probably the only way that that can be achieved. So, um, you know, it, it's really hard to. For, for me, I mean, it excites me. You know, it terrifies me. For me, <laughs> and and I think a lot of times when you think about where the good is it's hard to separate where the good is for me now and where the larger good is for um, what may be 100 years or 200 years in the future. And um, and then maybe there's a little bit of hubris attached to thinking that I have to decide what's best for me now, you know? Um, and But it's hard to let go of that, really hard to let go of that. Yeah, it's it's one of the the koans of living in a dualistic realm. I, I feel that so deeply, you know, like, how do I find my right orientation to what, how I choose to be? And how does that constantly touch back into what I'm meant to do and enact in the world around me? And the way that I, I feel that is, you know, like I said in the beginning, I, I would be a hermit. I would be a monk. I'd live in a cave. Like that would be very spiritually satisfying. I also kind of see that I can't do that. It's not what the call is. So I love that that inquiry, Phyllis. Thank you for raising that. And I, I think that gets to be like, we get to take that into the dojo of our own practice and of our mind and heart and just find the balance and the navigating and the present momentness of it. Uh, just wanted to follow that up real quickly with, um, yeah, I totally hear what you're saying, Phyllis. Um, I was deep into like, um, kind of trending. Uh, I, I was like, I was part of a, a mastermind group with Ray Kurzweil. So he wrote the singularity with, you know, Peter Diamandis and they founded the singularity university out of San Jose. And, you know, there's a lot of, there's just so much happening in those spaces of, you know, quantum computing and artificial intelligence, all those things. But I think ultimately, um, I think ultimately what, what, what could potentially happen with a lot of that technology is that it becomes sort of a tool to assist us in relating with our consciousness. Mm -hmm. At least that's my hope. And so, you know, like Edgar, Edgar Mitchell founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Is that, I don't know if that's what you're studying, Matt, but um but you know he he kind of came from a similar background I, as i understand it so he had this great awakening when he was doing his work and he realized when he was out in space and he looked down at the planet and he just hit him he just realized oh my god we're not so we, we fight about so many irrelevant seem you know to him at the moment it's so irrelevant things of like i'm you know i'm i'm from this part of brooklyn right or I'm from this part of Texas, or and it all just seemed to fade away for him. And for that moment in time, he just became so, so I don't know, just felt that this sort of transcendent experience of oneness with everyone on the planet. And I think, you know, it was sort of a connection 
as you know, for those of us that meditate, you know, when you self transcend and you enter this awareness, conscious awareness state of, I think, I think that's where the next evolution is in terms of, of embodying her, um, sort of, um, relating with ourselves in ways that we can't presently based on how we connect or relate with reality. And I think these tools can help us get there in some ways. I think I personally have the opinion that if there was a, a, a general artificial intelligence that they would deduce that that's, that's the nature of reality, that we're all interconnected and they're not going to try to like take us out, you know, but I don't know. That's just my <laughs> fantasy about that. But, um, but anyways, uh, I just thought I'd follow up with that because it made, just made me think of how I think it kind of connects to what we've discussed tonight. From your lips to to God's ears, John. <laughs> Anyone else with a feeling on that that kind of the the AI and the ascendant orientation of the human? Love to engage some other voices here. Well, there's sure anything else. There, there, well. I'll do do that and then something else. There's, I find that um, in playing with AI, that I that I feel a creativity boost. Mm. That that's hard for me to find on my own. Mm. <clears throat> that's and cool. I, I, and I also wanted to um, tie back to your your book. I, you know, I, I know we don't want to get deep into the book, but there's a part in the book where you talk about deep study and deep practice. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and how would you, how would you pull that in here? And, or is it elsewise? Goodness, it's been so long since I've read that part. Is there something in there specifically that you would like me to reference? Um, no, like what I said in my introduction is that you don't mess around. You 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 know when you get into something, you go you go deep. Um, I, I dabble, and so I, I um yeah, I want that magic. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Yeah, and and I don't have a a a preference for depth or dabbling. I think they're both so rich and important, um, and. I guess for me, the depth, like you go deep enough at the bottom of everything you study, you find God. And so I just get curious to peel back the layers and wonder when God's going to show up. It's always there. It's always there. Yeah. Regarding AI, um, the advent of AI upon humanity. Well, as we all know, the world has good actors and bad actors. And with any technology, the good actors and bad actors are jumping all over it. And a challenge that I see with AI, especially with the capability to mimic other personalities, like you can create an image of anybody that it looks like it's real. Yep. They sound like they're real. It's called deep fake. You can't tell what's real anymore. So there's a mm -hmm. blessing and a curse to this. Mm -hmm. The curse is, well, what the hell's real? How can I trust what I'm seeing anymore on YouTube or anywhere? Or even what I'm reading? And the blessing or maybe like a, a silver lining in the cloud is as I see it because of that ability to not know what to trust it's going to force us to be more hands-on with what we trust yeah the person right in front of us or beside us we know that's real not that their consciousness is very clear or very healthy or very mature <laughs> or very advanced or very evolved or whatever but it's it's real yeah we have we'll have a better ability to sort out what we want to deal with or how we want to deal with it than watching this barrage we're going to be getting very soon of these deep fake images of the that are just flat out lies put out by bad actors because yes. they just want to create chaos because their life 
There's so much pain, in my opinion, so much pain and chaos, upset, unhealthiness, that they just want to spread that to the rest of the world. Yeah. Hey, it's our choice. And it's our yeah. choice to do what we do. And I, how do we make the best of it in terms of what's healthy? So I see, I think the upside is, is you know, people can be getting away from, you know, just sitting there texting each other, even people beside them. And they're going to be forced to start to get better at the interpersonal connection because there's richness and reality in it. Yeah, exactly. Even if they're not very good at it, they'll have incentive and motivation now to get better at connecting with people who are real. And it might require a lot of deep fake going on. So people get so disillusioned that they finally realize, geez, what can I, what can I count on? Well, I can count on my brother or my sister, my mom, my dad, my son, my daughter, my whatever. Um, or I can't count on them, but at least I have a sense as to why. To yeah. <laughs> and uh, so I think it's just, you know, evolution playing out on this planet, humanity, the way we know so far. And our and our preoccupation with the right hand quadrants, the it. Yeah. And like you're saying earlier, Matt, it's how can we enliven the left quadrants? So I think AI is going to force us into more of the left hand quadrants, the real connection with people, lower left. Well, that's lower right too. It's actually mm -hmm. all four quadrants, the real mm -hmm. connection. And so, yeah, it's a blessing and a curse like pretty much anything, and uh, how can we navigate that? And in terms of what we're afraid of, what's triggering our fears, fears have a place. And what I've learned to do is look at, if, not that this happens hardly anymore, but when I used to get afraid, I used to look at, okay, what am I attached to that this fear is triggering I might lose? Mm -hmm. The ultimate is I might lose my life, my body. And once I got over lose, uh, not being afraid of death, and I've been exposed to that twice in real time over the last 20 years, so I know I'm not afraid of death. That's really freed me up to not be afraid of things and to look at AI more objectively, more with more compassion or understanding, whatever. And it is what it is. It's the latest technology. Yeah, it's a mind blower. I mean, it's there's a lot of cool, like Eli saying, there's a lot of cool things you can do with it. Yeah. For him, it enlivens his creativity. That's, that's a good thing, I think. Um, and it's got a destructive quality to it. Oh, well, what are we afraid of? Can we look at our fear or what we're attached to that causes the fear? Losing a job, losing income, losing clients, losing a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, or wife, losing a family member. There's usually some kind of loss associated with the fear. And can we mm -hmm. identify that in terms of our spiritual or consciousness work? Be able to get present to it enough, like I said earlier, see not what's not only in front of us, but what's behind our eyes. Can we learn to get into that space and look at what the fear and the attachment to what that relationship is? And clean it up, clear it up, grow it up. Well then. Sorry for talking so much. I'm on your team, Larry. Let's do it. What strikes me about what you said, Larry, is even when it was simple, like the 50s, <laughs> it was so limiting. You know, we thought we had the world by the oyster and it was simple. Everything was straightforward, but there was a lot of distortion and pain underneath. At least the distortion is going to be right up front. Uh I didn't know everything on YouTube wasn't true. I thought it was all true. It's part of being, you know, playing at the red and amber. It's just, yeah, you just, you don't know any better. You just trust, blind trust. And, oh, this is the way it is. Yeah, blessing and curse even 50 years ago. You know, the blessing was things were pretty predictable, at least from red and amber. And, uh, you know, the curse is, boy, I feel trapped. You know, there's got to be more to life than this. Those are two simple examples. but. Yeah, it's all good or bad, depending on what we're going to make of it. It's not nothing is absolutely good or bad. I mean, even so-called devil or Satan, whatever, there's a good side to that. It helps you realize and sort out, okay, who do I want to be in the world? What do I want to be in? So 
Um, yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's an upside to all of it, including AI. So Matt, on a different topic, or maybe not just Matt, everybody, um, one of the things that comes up for me is that what your 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 invitation is calling is calling for great courage. Um, it's not it's not a, an intellectual invitation. It's not a. It, you said hero's journey earlier, and that that really fits. So um, I'm feeling the. The power and the fear of the call. I I, I feel there's probably a couple of other people have things to say. This what I will say is that at the crossroads of that fear and power is very rich aliveness, and the current of that aliveness is often directional. And if we just follow the steps of that aliveness, there's often, and I know you know this, Eloy. It's just often something compelling at each step of that journey. <laughs> Earlier on, um, Phyllis said she used the word liminal. And I hear that and I heard it also woven into the talk. And I, I there's an excitement that I have with that because there's like a, uh, a hunger or something. And I I I know it means something, but I I'm not always in touch with with what it is. So I like that. It feels like it kind of hangs on the what you were saying about, okay, I'm going to let some of the time just go by without me filling the space with the words because I think there's something that's going to come. So that's, that's a part of it too. And I just thought of something that I'd heard recently that um, Teilhard de Chardin, um, I mean, he's so much more popular now than he ever was while he was alive. And the thing I had recently heard is none of his works were allowed to be published during the time of his of his life. So he didn't get a chance to have those things put out there on the roast, or whatever, and 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 um, you know, and forged and 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 gone back and forth of it. And and I might think, oh, I don't want anybody to challenge what I've said, but when I heard that. You know, it's like, yes, that's what we need to help us to help us get somewhere. And I mentioned in the in the um, in the breakout that I'm seeing and this just started coming to me a few days ago that I'm seeing me, you know, throwing all this stuff in a cauldron and, and I'm just like stirring it up. But I'm thinking, you know what, whatever it is, is going to settle in or out or whatever and it might make more sense to me so I was looking at I just looked it up and it was like the things that can be put in the cauldron would be like the eye of a newt and the toe of a frog and the wool of bat and tongue of a dog you know a lizard's leg and that's how some of this stuff sounds to me it's like uh you know I don't you know I don't know what this means but I'm gonna just put it in the cauldron because it's coming up for for some reason and then another part of that was talking about the the womb and what it represents our insecurities and our our symbolizing um what is it the the you know the the working part of um i don't know it, it, it just it really uh, it's in there and it's getting mixed around it feels like it is of some value i don't have it sorted out yet listening to things like this um helps uh, uh, immensely someone else will put into words the things that i uh sensed but um didn't have the words for and and as i lose uh, it seems like i can't come up with the words that i'm thinking of and that will stop me sometimes from from talking because oh, i don't remember who that was you know who said that or you know and and that can hold us back but the other thing is the um, the some of the best things are beyond words. So maybe that's part of it. You know, it's like I'm not coming up for the words I want to use to express something because the words don't give it any justice anyway. So 
Anyway, that's my words. I love your reference to Tila Deshadan. So when they suppressed his book, he gets reassigned to go to China and he works with the archaeologist that discovered Peking man. And it just reinforced his evolutionary beliefs. Uh, it was like he just couldn't suppress a great idea. And then about 15 years ago, Retzinger came out and said, there's nothing in his book that's incompatible with Catholicism. So, you know, like we, where we are today, it just takes time. And I really love Matt, the, the idea that um, what we do is, I can never say this, mycelial. What we do as integralists has very mycelial properties to it. And we don't know when it's going to emerge, when it's going to take an effect. None of us know. But it's necessary because it is the underlying structure that makes everything evolutionary possible. So I never heard it applied to an integralist by Celio. I, I love that. Thank you both. And and yeah, I sometimes feel like it's the that that adage of the what is it the loving man plants trees under which he'll never enjoy the shade of or something like that you know it's kind of that same endeavor and and that's what chardin did as well it's like he had that thing inside of him it had to come out he never benefited from that but we definitely are benefiting from that beautiful i think he knew it i think he just accepted it it was his gift so the um I, I think that, uh, what was his name? You told us, Forrest Landry would have loved his emphasis upon care. Interestingly, after this, uh, Forrest is going to be over at the house. I'm having dinner with him. So, <laughs> so I'll let him know that we all enjoyed his work tonight. <laughs> Tell him he said hello. I will. Would people like to see him present that San Diego integral? Uh, I'm happy to invite him if he'd be interested. I know he's looking for spaces where he can share some of the, the frames. So um, I'd be happy to make that contact if that would be useful. You know, have him get a hold of the Eloy? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Eloy. Mm -hmm. There's... One more thing I sort of wanted to mention uh, that was brought up in our breakout group by someone who's been, who's still here, but was is very rather quiet. And we didn't get to talk about it. It was very at the end uh, and it had to do with um, illness and we're, you know, we're, we're getting sick. A lot of us are getting sick. And I just went through um, what felt to me like a pretty huge um burning away of a lot of stuff and it, and Rumi has a poem that speaks to it where it's like you go through and you get totally trashed and ruined and you know like down to the rocks of the stream and only to be come back and be built up um better and I I um I heard that and I wish I could have you know I'm saying right now I I heard I hear it and I'm not calling anybody's name out, but they're, they're still here. And uh, thank you for that, because I think that's an important thing that we can look at, that we can look at and we can get all scared and run around, but we can also go through it and see what comes out the other side. Um, and, you know, I mean, to me, ideally, it would um, uh, challenge some of the things about our medical industrial complex. Um, I mean, I just, I was just, you just got done with the immunoglobulin treatment during the course of this session. And that stupid thing is $12,000 a month. Uh, oh, and I'm all happy because my insurance covers it, but I'm, I'm ready to start breaking away from that too, as I don't feel that I need it anymore, even though I may have for a time. Um, but that, I mean, that would, that's a whole nother, um, 
you know, go for hope. But um, yeah, it's um, thank you for bringing that up in our group. You remain unnamed. Thank you, Mary, for the acknowledgement. Another place I really connected with all of that is um, somewhere in Matt's wide ranging presentation, he talked about self care and how so called spiritual entrepreneurs, you know, tend to, I don't think he used the word burnout, but they just, uh, run themselves ragged doing the care aspect. And of course, it's almost a um, cliche, actually, for those of us that work in that domain. And my great concern that I shared in the breakout, and I'll just briefly share here, is we have, I, I don't know, unless you're actually personally affected yourself, and of course many of us are or have close friends or relatives that are, there's a chronic disease epidemic happening. This isn't even talking about, you know, the virus or the things we have good treatments for, like something you can fix with surgery or a, an antibiotic or a discrete organism that's causing something. That's not most of what's making people sick. And a lot of what is causing these chronic illnesses an immense amount of suffering um, it happens over decades. And then, you know, the camel's back breaks. It's lifestyle, but it's, I'm not, I, this isn't a personal responsibility rant. It's very like multi layered, multifactorial. And it's really hard to pull out the roots of it because the profiteering is so the big pharma and the food systems and the insurance systems, it's very hard to pull out the root and even reform, let alone transform or revolutionize this. It's education. It's like most doctors and clinicians don't have any training in nutrition or the metabolism of, of the biochemistry of metabolism and chronic disease, they just are not taught these things. They never were in, in medicine 2.0 and they aren't now. Um, it's, um, it's like really a mess. <laughs> it's really a mess to the tune of 4 trillion a year, most of which is going to profiteers. So, um, I don't mean to be a downer. Um, I've worked in this arena for four decades and across disciplines and specialties and left and gone back. But I, I don't think there are many people unless they actually work in the mainstream health sector that have a clue how big this is and it's going, it's going to break us. It's one of the things that's going to break us. Because if you don't have your health and your brain and your body to, get, to go into action or do something every day, then you can't, you know, all the rest of it's kind of extra. If your body's not working and your brain's not working. At least that's my personal experience of illness. It's like I'm pretty useless as an aspirational bodhisattva uh, if I'm not in very good shape health-wise myself. So 
I, I call it a national, it's a national security problem, actually. And it's not the obvious one. This is such a, um, like, a, I have a really poorly formed thought <laughs> going on. And, and, and so forgive me if it, um, if it ramps if it rambles a bit and stop me if it does. Um, the whole idea of chronicity is such an interesting thing. I've been on um, pretty much every side of a hospital bed. Um, I, I've, you know, uh, been, you know, a professional on the side of the hospital bed, been in it. I've been on the side of it as a family member. I've been advocating, I've been advocated for, I've been, you know, um, but chronicity, is this whole um, way of living under sort of the, the, the delusion, you get deluded, things are linear, that things are like, um, you know, chronicity is such a weird thing because it, it really can hypnotize you into um, non-action or, non, um, or not even knowing that action is like a possible even thing, you know? It's like you get something acute and it's like acute, okay, we'll fix it and, or we won't and you'll die or you will fix it and you won't die or you know what I mean? But, um, but the whole idea of things being uh, linear um, is, is um, I wonder sometimes if it's kind of like a spell that we're taught that that keeps us from realizing that life is really paradigm shifts and that life is really um, you know that that for the most part things like happen and you gotta jump or make a decision or make a uh, uh, what am I talking about? Um, I had I had uh, uh, kidney disease and I had no idea of how sick I was because it was hereditary. I had had it for my whole life, and um, and all of a sudden, um, it, it be, uh, my numbers were at a place where most people would have been di on dialysis for years already, you know. But because it was chronic, I didn't even feel it until I had a transplant. And all of a sudden, it's like, oh my God, this is what life is supposed to feel like. You know, it's like you don't know. You have this incredible blindness. Um, you know, chronicity causes. And and um and so Debbie, I don't. You know, I'm re I'm referring to what you're talking about, but it's not just with illness. It's like with the way we tend. The way I think. I am perhaps more than just I have lived my life being, you know, having blind spots come up in um, these sort of like lineal expectations. And, you know, um, Eloy, I, you, you said it um, in, the, in the chat, so I hope I'm not, you know, um, but I, and then Mary wrote, um, maybe we need to be broken. And, you know, please God, everything is going to go really well. And, but what I, what I wish for you, pray for you is that that is truly a, a, a transformative experience where all of a sudden you're, you're forced into someplace different and seeing things new and seeing things, you know, and that's like sort of the beauty of acute, you know, <laughs> and that, that it really does flip you to someplace else. And please God, it'll be a really, really good place. Um, so be well, kid, <laughs> be well. Thanks, I've seen it as uh, Kintsugi, the, the Japanese art of repairing pottery with gold. Uh, there's a, a, a goddess, I think it's um, Lakshmi, I may be using, I, I may have the wrong word, but she is the goddess of never not broken. And it's through the broken places that the light 
shines through. Um, and, uh, you know, I, so that's why you just got to treasure it all for me. The best he would. Yeah, it comes back to Phyllis, what you're saying, and, and, uh, and uh, Mary's comment about maybe we need to be broken. I don't know if we need to, but we are probably sooner or later to some degree or another. And it reminds me of the story, and, and I'm not good at memorizing stories, but you'll all probably recognize this, the one of the farmer. And the neighbor comes over and says, oh, I hear your son got into this, that, or the other. That, that, you know, such good fortune. And the farmer just basically says, whatever he says, okay. And then uh, the son has an accident and the neighbor comes over. Oh, that's that's such bad fortune. Okay. And the point is, there's a series of events that happened to this son. And whether we judge them as good or bad doesn't make much difference as to what can we learn from them? How can we make the best from them? And become more whole people, more loving people, more giving people, more kind people, more evolved people. Um, life is just happening. And we create a lot of that, even a lot of the so-called negative stuff, we create a lot of it ourselves. And yeah, how can we make the best of it? That's beautiful. Thank you all for sharing so vulnerably. And and Debbie and Eloy, I just want to offer, you know, maybe we just take 10, 15 seconds here in prayer for you because we know the inactive and healing power of prayer. And just so I'll just state and maybe a couple of people would just like to join me in silence, but I'll just say like holding you in my heart and holding you in the energy of what we've created and cultivated here today. And thank you for who you are and what you do. And thank you for your devotion to the mission. And thank you for your work of, of creating this space and all the other spaces I know you all serve. We appreciate you. And we are holding you in your most exalted and healthy state. Well, thank you, Matt, for this space that you've created for us from what we've created for you to be here and serving each other, um, a valued presentation. Um, I'm glad to have gotten to know you better and to feel you in your journey mm. and being of service to us and to yourself and all's good. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. And on that note, I'm out. I think this is probably my moment to meet Forrest, have some dinner. Feels like we're winding down. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. It's really been a gift. Yeah, beautiful to be with you, here with all of you. <laughs> and thank you, Matt. See you again soon. For further information, including upcoming events, resources, links to our Facebook and Meetup pages, and our fabulous Donate button, please visit our website at sandiegointegral.org. Donations are greatly appreciated and help us to continue to provide information and connection within the Integral community.